November, the month marking the end of fall and the beginning of winter. Colorful leaves scatter the ground below, as colder temperatures begin to engulf the northern hemisphere. A month that serves as a time of remembrance and thankfulness. Families gather together to remember the dead in the first few days of the month, and gather once more to give thanks for what they have during the Thanksgiving holiday. In 2013, that was no different. Families were shopping for food to cook for the Thanksgiving holiday, and began gathering together to be thankful of what they have. But for portions of the Midwestern United States, those activities were cut short because a week and a half before Thanksgiving, tragedy struck. On November 17th, 2013, a violent tornado outbreak occurred across the Midwestern United States, spawning 73 tornadoes across a number of states, including two EF4 tornadoes. A near record-breaking severe weather event in an unusual location for the time of year, leaving many across Illinois, Indiana, and Kentucky with nothing but their lives and the clothes on their backs. Yet, despite the extreme devastation left behind by the dozens of significant tornadoes across the Midwest, the November 17th, 2013 tornado outbreak is relatively unknown to those outside of those who live through the event and weather enthusiasts. The outbreak was forgotten by many, overshadowed by the Moore EF5 tornado and the El Reno EF3 that occurred in May that year. Despite the outbreak being overshadowed by the other two tornado events of that year, I feel like the November 17th, 2013 tornado outbreak warrants a deep dive to bring attention to what feels like the most significant forgotten tornado outbreak of 2013. So today, I will be taking a deep dive into the November 17th, 2013 tornado outbreak, covering the state of tornadic events of 2013 thus far, the synopsis, the outbreak itself, and the aftermath. Welcome to Nature's Fury. 2013 was, by all accounts, one of the most, if not the most, inactive year for tornadoes by number of tornadoes in the United States. 905 tornadoes touched down across the United States that year, the least amount of tornadoes ever recorded in a single year in recent memory. Despite the low number of tornadoes, a number of major tornado outbreaks occurred that year, including two of the most infamous tornadoes of the next rad era. The first major tornado event was on February 10th, when an EF4 tornado struck Hattiesburg, Mississippi, but most of tornado season was relatively quiet in terms of tornado activity. Until mid-May. On May 15th, an EF4 tornado struck Granbury, Texas, just a few days later, a tornado outbreak occurred from May 18th through the 21st, including the infamous Moore EF5, the most recent EF5 tornado at the time of recording. An outbreak occurred less than a week later, once again in the Great Plains. This one included the infamous El Reno 2013 tornado, known for being the deadliest disaster in storm-chasing history. From thenceforth, tornado activity was either average or below average in the United States. Before November 17th, a small but devastating tornado outbreak occurred in the Northern Plains, including two EF4 tornadoes, one of which hit near Wayne, Nebraska. From there on, there was a lull of tornado activity across the country. 2013 has the record for the least amount of tornadoes ever recorded in a single year in the continental United States since records have been capped. But going into November, an unusual setup was taking place for an upper echelon tornado outbreak to occur in the upper Midwest during a time where the states would normally be expecting the beginning of winter weather. But real quick, only a small portion of the people who like these weather documentaries are subscribed to the channel. So if you enjoy what I do, consider subscribing. It helps support what I do and tells me I'm doing something right. Also, I have a Discord server that I frequently talk in. Link to that is in the description. Anyways, back to the November 17th, 2013 tornado outbreak. During the late hours of the 16th, a negatively tilted trough with an associated surface cyclone and cold front that was present across the Central Plains was beginning to turn towards the northeast. Associated with the trough was a strong low-level jet. The low-level jet's purpose is extremely important for this outbreak in particular. The low-level jet would funnel moisture from the southern United States northward into portions of Illinois and Indiana. The surface cyclone was expected to move through the upper Midwest and the specific environmental factors associated with what was expected was horrifying and extremely unusual for the month of November. So let's talk about that more. Let's begin with moisture and temperatures. Like I just stated, the low-level jet played a significant role in the warm and humid conditions observed in the upper Midwest that morning. 
with dew points expected to be from the low to mid 60s across the mid-Mississippi Valley and through the Ohio River Valley. What also did not help was the development of a warm front in northern Illinois, which allowed for warmer temperatures, leading to further instability in the area. Speaking of instability, let's talk about that. Surface Base Cape was expected to be over 1,500 joules per kilogram, and long, looped photographs suggested that supercells and tornadoes would be likely across the upper Midwest. Wind shear was expected to be in abundance. Zero to six kilometer shear was expected to be around 70 knots across portions of Illinois and Indiana, with storm relative helicity expected to be in excess of 400 meters squared per second squared in some areas. What also helped with the wind shear was the low-level jet and the mid-level jet, the low-level jet had winds in excess of 65 knots across much of Illinois and Indiana, with the mid-level jet present across where much of the severe weather would occur that day. The mid-level jet was expected to have winds ranging from 80 to 100 knots, a sign that shear was not going to be an issue for this outbreak. Due to the strong, large-scale ascent associated with the upper-level trough, discrete supercells were expected to initiate ahead of the cold front across Illinois, and then expand into southern Michigan and into Indiana. Behind the discrete supercell mode was the expectation of a developing squall line along the cold front that was expected to absorb the discrete supercells ahead of the line. Considering the temperatures, moisture, the cape, and the wind shear, the signs of a violent tornado outbreak across the upper Midwest occurring were practically slapping forecasters in the face. Signs of said outbreak were noticed days in advance, with the SBC slowly upgrading their outlooks as November 17th came closer. On November 14th, a Day 4 outlook encompassed much of the Mississippi and Ohio River valleys, with a slight risk issued for those areas on their Day 3 outlook on November 15th. On November 16th, a rare Day 2 moderate risk was issued for Illinois, Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, and Michigan. And the next day, a high risk, the highest risk category that the SPC can issue, was issued for central and eastern Illinois, most of Indiana, southern Michigan, and western Ohio. For the upper Midwest, the November 17th, 2013 tornado outbreak still has the record for the latest high risk ever issued by the Storm Prediction Center during the calendar year. The high risk was driven by the threat of tornadoes, with a 30% SIG tornado risk being issued for the areas in the high risk. Strong winds were also a major threat, with a 45% SIG wind threat extending from central Michigan and into Kentucky. The threat of large hail was not expected to be as significant as the threat of tornadoes or strong winds, but a 30% hail risk was issued for much of Illinois going into Missouri. Regardless, going into the outbreak, what models were indicating was frightening. Not to mention, this was occurring in the month of November. November is often referred to as part of the second season of severe weather, However, that activity is usually only isolated to the lower Mississippi Valley. But with it being in the Midwest, meteorologists were on edge. Another odd feature of this outbreak was its timing. The event was expected to occur from the mid-morning through the early afternoon. This was not expected to occur during peak daytime heating early on. And yet, it would be the morning storms that would be the strongest storms of the day. But with the stage set, the morning of November 17th came, and the events began to unfold. Even before the first tornado touched down after 10 a.m. Central Standard Time, conditions for severe weather that was outlined in the SPC outlooks were already beginning to be confirmed. And in some locations, atmospheric conditions were overperforming. The mid-level jet was already in excess of 80 knots across much of Illinois, and the speed of the mid-level jet would only continue to increase as the day continued. Winds at the 850 millibar level showed widespread areas of wind speeds in excess of 50 knots, with the speed of the winds continuing to increase. 0 to 6 kilometer bulk shear was over 50 knots across much of Illinois and Indiana, with some areas seeing over 100 knots of bulk shear across southern Illinois. Storm relative helicity was extremely high, with many areas having storm relative helicity values in excess of 400 meters squared per second squared with some areas seeing SRH values in excess of 600 and even 700 meters squared per second squared. Surface Base Cape was at least 1,000 joules per kilogram across much of Illinois and into Indiana, although lesser values were observed around much of the mid-Mississippi and Ohio River valleys. 
The temperatures were warm, with many areas seeing temperatures in the lower to upper 70s, and dew points indicated a moist environment, with dew points in the low to upper 60s across much of the Mississippi and Ohio River Valley. Already, the conditions for a tornado outbreak to occur across Illinois and into Indiana was apparent, and it was only a matter of time before storms started firing, and in advance of those storms, tornado watches began to be issued. At 8.40 a.m. Central Standard Time, a particularly dangerous situation tornado watch was issued for most of Illinois and into portions of Missouri, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Indiana, with an 80% chance of two or more tornadoes and a 70% chance of a significant tornado. At 10.20 a.m. Central Standard Time, another particularly dangerous situation tornado watch with the same tornado probabilities was issued for most of Indiana and into portions of Western Ohio and Southern and Central Michigan. Another tornado watch was issued at 10.45 a.m. Central Standard Time for portions of Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Arkansas. Supercell thunderstorms began to initiate across portions of the mid-Mississippi Valley as early as 8 a.m. on November 17th. The storms would progress towards the northeast, with more and more thunderstorms initiating in Illinois. It was only a matter of time before the supercell thunderstorms would start producing tornadoes. At 10.52 a.m., a supercell thunderstorm produced the first tornado of the day in Pekin, Illinois. The supercell would quickly cycle, and the tornado that followed was the strongest tornado of the day. A cell that produced an EF2 tornado in central Illinois cycled and produced another tornado 2.4 miles southeast of East Peoria at 10.59 a.m. The tornado proceeded to move through portions of the town, destroying 20 homes and causing major damage to numerous other homes and structures. The tornado continued to move towards the northeast, widening from anywhere between a quarter of a mile to a half a mile wide as it hit the town of Washington, Illinois. The town suffered extreme damage, as winds estimated to be around 190 miles per hour smashed into hundreds upon hundreds of homes, businesses, and other buildings. Nearly 5,000 people were in the path of the tornado, and all of them felt its wrath. The tornado began to weaken after passing through Washington, Illinois, moving into Tazewell County, going through mostly open fields, destroying dozens of farmsteads in its path. The tornado continued into LaSalle County, weakening to EF2 intensity, causing roof damage to homes and snapping power poles. The tornado continued to move into Livingston County as a high-end EF2, with winds of 135 miles per hour, destroying and damaging several outbuildings. A large shed, which housed a fire engine, was destroyed with the engine being rolled onto its side. The tornado moved further to the northeast, causing extensive tree damage before lifting near Route 23. The Washington, Illinois tornado was the strongest tornado of the outbreak, and the strongest tornado recorded in the month of November in the state of Illinois ever since records began in 1950 with peak winds of 190 miles per hour and a maximum width of a half a mile wide. The tornado traveled a little over 46 miles, causing nearly $1 billion in damages, killing three, and injuring 125. At 12.04 p.m. Central Standard Time, a short-lived but violent tornado touched down on I-64, 4.4 miles southwest of New Minden, Illinois. The tornado moved towards New Minden, where a small farm southwest of the town took a direct hit. The homestead was completely destroyed, with only the foundation remaining. The tornado raced towards the northeast, producing significant damage to the St. John's Lutheran Church and several homes to the northwest of the church. Two of the homes sustained EF3 damage. As the tornado continued on its path of destruction, the tornado caused sporadic damage to the north of Hoylton, and a farm two miles west-northwest of the town sustained significant damage, and so did two newly constructed homes. The tornado began to steer towards the northwest, and lifted shortly thereafter. The tornado was small and short-lived, being 200 yards wide and only traveling 10.6 miles. However, the tornado was violent, with peak winds of 180 miles per hour. At 12.44 p.m., a tornado touched down 3.7 miles northwest of Tuscola, Illinois. The tornado initially caused damage to a roof of a house and two buildings, but after crossing U.S. Highway 45, the tornado strengthened in intensity. Two houses, several large farm buildings, 
numerous power poles, and a garage sustained major damage from the tornado after it passed U.S. Highway 45. The tornado turned towards the east, damaging roofs of two homes and destroying several outbuildings. Crossing over I-57, the tornado continued to cause major damage before merging with another tornado two miles west-northwest of Villa Grove. After absorbing the other tornado, the tornado moved through mostly open fields in Champaign County, destroying about a dozen outbuildings and taking the roof off of a home. The tornado continued moving towards the northeast, lifting 2.7 miles north-northwest of Broadlands at 1.02 p.m. The Tuscola EF3 caused $2 million in damages, with peak winds of 140 miles per hour, a path length of 18 miles, and a peak width of 440 yards. The Gifford EF3 tornado touched down one mile southeast of Thomasboro, Illinois at 12.45 p.m. The tornado rapidly moved towards the northeast, rapidly gaining intensity, causing damage to three farms and pushing two farmhouses off their foundations. After hitting the farmhouses, the tornado continued over open fields, widening to a quarter of a mile wide and becoming rain-wrapped, destroying three homes and several outbuildings before moving through Gifford. The tornado widened out to about half a mile wide as it moved through Gifford, destroying nearly 30 homes with more than 40 houses suffering major damage and 125 suffering minor damage. Around 15 businesses suffered moderate to major damage, and the roof of a school was peeled back. The tornado continued moving towards the northeast for about five miles, destroying three homes and damaging several others before crossing into Vermilion County. The tornado continued through rural Vermilion County, destroying multiple outbuildings and a house. The tornado weakened as it left Vermilion County and into Iroquois County, causing minor damage before lifting at 1.14 p.m. In total, the tornado caused $62.5 million in damages, with a peak width of half a mile wide, peak winds of 140 miles per hour, and a path length of 29.7 miles. The tornado injured six, but no deaths were recorded due to the Gifford tornado. However, one of the most notable supercells formed outside of the high-risk area, in southern Missouri, and would end up producing three EF3 tornadoes, one of which nearly made a direct hit on Paducah, Kentucky. The first tornado produced by the supercell was a tornado in Scott County, Missouri, after the tornado spawned, the tornado destroyed two stick-built homes, a vehicle was blown out of a garage, and three empty railroad cars were overturned. The tornado crossed across Scout County, destroying or damaging several mobile homes, blowing away irrigation systems, and snapping dozens of trees before the tornado lifted to the northeast of Blodgett, Missouri. The tornado was on the ground for 14.25 miles, with winds of 140 miles per hour and a peak width of 600 yards. The tornado caused $1 million in damages, but no deaths or injuries were attributed to the Scott County tornado. Nearly an hour later, the supercell dropped down another tornado close to the Ballard County line at 2.05 p.m. The tornado moved through McCracken County, causing minor damage to homes, uprooting or snapping off trees, bending road signs, and destroying a church foyer. However, the tornado began to intensify as it struck a uranium enrichment plant west of Gramville. But at this time, people were beginning to panic as it seemed as if the tornado was heading straight for Paducah, Kentucky. The tornado crossed over the Ohio River, barely missing downtown Paducah, becoming completely rain-wrapped as it came ashore into Brookport, Illinois, with peak winds near 145 miles per hour. One and a half dozen mobile homes were damaged in Brookport, killing three. One home was leveled, dozens of homes and buildings suffered structural damages, and hundreds of residences were affected by the tornado. The tornado crossed into Pope County, destroying mobile homes before crossing back into Kentucky. The tornado moved south of Smithland, destroying several mobile homes and uprooting trees before continuing into Lyon County. The tornado crossed into Lyon County, causing mostly tree damage before lifting at 2.45 p.m. Central Standard Time. In total, the tornado had peak winds of 145 miles per hour, a peak width of 500 yards, traveling a total of 42 miles. The tornado was responsible for $5.5 million in damages, 3 deaths, and 33 injuries. The supercell produced a final tornado at 3.32 p.m. Central Standard Time in Hopkins County, Kentucky, a couple miles southwest of Nortonville, moving east across Penryville Parkway. 
Four homes were destroyed, including one double-wide mobile home. The exterior walls of a permanent home collapsed, and a dozen homes received minor to moderate damage. The tornado continued to move through Hopkins County, destroying several sheds and barns, and uprooting and snapping hundreds of trees. The tornado moved south of White Plains before dissipating a few miles to the southeast of the town. The tornado was on the ground for a little over 8 miles, with peak winds of 145 miles per hour and a peak width of 200 yards, causing $700,000 in damages. At 2.54 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, a tornado touched down 5 miles south-southeast of Lafayette, Indiana. The tornado moved through the Subaru and Vost Alpine plants, southeast of Lafayette, both sustaining low-end EF3 damage. The tornado continued moving towards the northeast, causing property and tree damage as it moved into Clinton County, causing EF0 tree damage before moving into southwest Carroll County. A hog farm sustained damage to several outbuildings in extreme southwest Carroll County, but damage in the county was mostly EF0 to EF1 damage. The tornado then moved into Cass County, going over mostly open fields before impacting some residences, causing minor damage. The tornado destroyed a small barn before intensifying as it moved into a grove of trees, where every tree for the first 100 feet was snapped 5 to 10 feet above the base. The tornado continued over open fields, causing minor tree damage before lifting a few miles southwest of the Grissom Air Reserve Base. The tornado was on the ground for 39 miles, with peak winds of 140 miles per hour and a peak width of 250 yards. The tornado was responsible for $785,000 in damages. At 2.41 p.m. Central Standard Time, a tornado touched down to the northwest of Morgan Field, Kentucky, and tracked north and parallel to U.S. Highway 60. The tornado struck a church and several homes, causing roof damage or substantial structural damage, and one house had complete roof loss. A large, metal storage building was destroyed, with the steel I-beams supporting the roof twisted. The tornado proceeded into Henderson County, weakening as it moved through the center of Corydon, causing significant roof damage before lifting to the east of town. The tornado caused $750,000 in damages, with peak winds of 145 miles per hour, a peak width of 200 yards, and a path length of 14.5 miles. At 4.35 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, a tornado touched down in Perrysburg, Ohio, initially producing EF0 damage, but as it continued towards the northeast, the tornado strengthened to EF2 strength, with two warehouse buildings having their walls blown down and large sections of the roofing being lost. A gas station at the intersection of State Route 795 and Oregon Road was heavily damaged. Other buildings suffered minor damage. The tornado weakened to EF0 intensity and proceeded to fluctuate from EF0 to EF1 intensity as it moved into Lucas County. The tornado intensified to EF1 strength as it hit Pearson Metro Park, tearing off the roof of a house and damaging another home in the area. The tornado briefly intensified to EF2 intensity near Saruman Street in Oregon, damaging many homes, primarily through roof damage, but two homes suffered enough damage to be considered destroyed. After passing north of Oregon, the tornado lifted. The tornado had a peak width of 100 yards and a path length of 11.46 miles, causing $2.6 million in damages. Despite the tornadoes being the primary threat, there were other threats of severe weather that day. Ferocious winds were a major threat that day, with 579 wind reports being received from the Storm Prediction Center that day, including 19 hurricane-force wind reports. The strongest winds reported from the outbreak were three separate instances of 100 mph per hour straight-line winds being recorded that day, those being at Crown Point, Indiana, Swayze, Indiana, and Ogle County, Illinois. The straight-line winds were responsible for massive power outages across Michigan, Indiana, and much of Ohio, with over 500,000 people across the Ohio River Valley losing power at one point or another during the event. Large hail was also a threat that day, with the largest hail being recorded at 4 inches in diameter in Bloomington, Illinois. However, the number of hail reports was relatively low compared to the tornado and wind reports, with only 42 hail reports being submitted to the Storm Prediction Center. As the outbreak progressed during the 17th, the line of supercells formed into an extensive squall line that would track through the mid-Atlantic states, bringing strong winds to those states as the system pushed out into the Atlantic Ocean. 
as the storms began to clear across the Midwest, people were now beginning to see the extent of the damage firsthand. And it was worse than many could imagine, especially for a tornado outbreak in mid-November. Just a week and a half before Thanksgiving, many families across Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky came out to see what the tornadoes had just taken away from them. Scenes across the river valleys were eerily similar. Mobile homes were tossed around and completely destroyed. Trees were snapped, uprooted, or debarked in the worst case. Damage to houses and well-built structures ranged from minor damage to roof loss to the loss of exterior walls and houses just being wiped from existence. But the worst of the damage was localized to the areas that suffered from the EF3 and EF4 tornadoes. In Gifford, numerous buildings were damaged, ranging from minor roof damage to homes being torn into pieces. Widespread devastation throughout the small town was apparent. South of Lafayette, Indiana, the Subaru and Alpine plants were heavily damaged due to the tornado, where the worst of the damage occurred in Indiana. The supercell responsible for three separate EF3 tornadoes devastated the areas it hit, but of those three tornadoes, the primary focus was on what occurred just north of Paducah. The city of Brookport suffered from large amounts of debris littering the streets. Mobile homes were shredded throughout the city and the suburbs of Brookport. While Paducah was spared, Brookport was not. But the worst of the damage was observed from the two EF4 tornadoes. The new Minden EF4 tornado wiped an entire house off its foundation, although most of the damage from the new Minden EF4 was rated EF2 or below. The absolute worst damage was observed in Washington, Illinois, where house after house after house was destroyed into pieces. Trees were snapped, cars were covered and smashed with debris, the absolute destruction of the Washington tornado was on a scale that wasn't seen in the state of Illinois in recent memory. The small town with a population of nearly 5,000 was left in shock as a monster swept through the town, leaving many in the town with nothing but their lives. But even so, some weren't as lucky. Some lost their lives because of the tornado. In total, 73 tornadoes spawned across the Mississippi and Ohio River Valleys on November 17th, with 13 EF0s, 28 EF1s, 23 EF2s, 7 EF3s, and 2 EF4s, one of the most intense tornado outbreaks observed in Illinois and Indiana in recent memory, and one of the most widespread tornado outbreaks observed in the River Valleys in the month of November. The severe weather outbreak was responsible for $1.6 billion in damages, the deaths of eight people, with three of those being non-tornadic, and over 190 injuries. To many people outside of the areas affected and weather enthusiasts, the November 17th, 2013 tornado outbreak is seemingly forgotten, overshadowed by the Moore and El Reno tornadoes from May of that year. Understandably so, those two tornadoes are two of the most infamous tornadoes in recent memory, and in the case of El Reno 2013, one of the most infamous tornadoes in US history. But despite that, the outbreak observed on November 17th, 2013 is an outbreak that I think deserves to be discussed more often. From the destruction observed across Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky, to the sheer intensity of the tornadoes that day, to the fact that the outbreak even occurred where it occurred in, in the middle of November. There are a lot of interesting aspects to this outbreak that I think should be talked about more often. It's an outbreak that brought devastation to many people, and nearly nine years later, the pain that those who survived these tornadoes suffer from still lingers to this day. It's an outbreak that the victims of this outbreak will surely never forget, and it's an outbreak that I can say after looking deeper into the outbreak and how it happened, I will not be forgetting anytime soon. Uh, so, um, the schedule has changed. My living situation right now is up in the air, and when I do move out of where I'm living, which that decision is apparently not even final, it may be up to a few weeks or so before I finally get everything set up again. As to why, I had to make an update video recently explaining what has been going on and how this will severely affect my channel and its upload schedule. 
bunch of health stuff relating to my grandmother. I can confidently say that. And so, unless something stupid happens, I should be back to a normal schedule of an upload at least once every two weeks or so, come into late January or early February at the absolute latest. There's just been so much going on that I cannot really explain it all here, and a link to that update video is in the description. Special thanks to my proofreaders, those being Rishi and Alice, for proofreading the script and making sure I don't sound like an idiot, and Celtic White for the amazing stills I commissioned. This is the very first video I am actually using these stills in, and I cannot thank them enough for how well this turned out. I also want to give a special shout out to the channel patrons, those being Ace Cooper, Maxwell Looney, and Montpellier at the Alfie's Army tier, and Basilius of Stupidonia, King Shisa, Neon Binary, and Worm Off the String at the Alf Mini tier. If you want to help support me financially and get access to my scripts early and whatnot, consider joining the Patreon. I know the credit section is short this time, but if I went any further than what I'm comfortable with writing in a credit sequence, we'd be here for an additional 10 minutes and I'm not doing that. That being said, I am Alfaria, hope you all enjoyed, make sure to comment, like, subscribe, all that jazz. You all stay safe out there, and I'll see you all soon.